Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, Lawrence and Fred and Alicia for setting this up. I can't honestly imagine how much work went into this. Uh, so thank you for a really well-oiled machine. I want to share with you, too, my first um, interaction with Richard Leakey. That was in 1979. Uh, I was an undergraduate finishing a term paper that I was sending in as a manuscript for publication. And my professor, David Pilbeam, said, you know, I think Richard Leakey would like to read this paper. He's in London right now, waiting a kidney transplant. And this would be something to give him that would get his mind off of that. And I'm like, whoa, send this paper to Richard Leakey? So it's like, OK. So I did. And I included a little note along with the manuscript and uh, didn't think much of it. And about two weeks later, I got back one of those nice handwritten letters that Bernard Wood mentioned the other day that was very personable. It was on point. He uh, was able to offer comments about the paper. But the thing that I remember the most from that was just how encouraging that letter was. And when I opened that up, I was like, oh my gosh, this is a letter from Richard Leakey. I mean, I was a kid who grew up on a family farm in Idaho. <laughs> and uh, you know, my job was milking cows. And on the night that there was a National Geographic special, by God, I made sure I had those cows milked, the animals fed, so I had my butt planted in front of a TV when any of you who are my age can hum along with me that National Geographic theme song, da 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 So I knew where I was when those shows started. And with that letter, again, the thing was just how encouraging it was with, with uh, uh, his support for me. And at that point, I told myself, I said, Cap, you know, you may actually have something that you can contribute to the study of human origins and evolution. And I still remember that today because when I wake up every morning, I think that that's still a testable hypothesis. Will I actually have something to contribute or not? So what I want to talk about today is the, uh, really the uh, last slide first, and that's the work we've been doing at Nukwai and also at uh, Losadoc. As has been mentioned by everybody, we have large teams uh, that do this work. And to point out here, Mercedes uh, Gutierrez, on the other side down here, Tab Rasmussen, and then up here, uh, Ellen Miller. This work is one where it has to be collaborative. We work together as a group, and uh, uh, it can't work otherwise. And I list here all the uh, people and groups that have supported us as well. Well, it's easy for me to give this because Natasha laid this out for us. And what we're looking at going into the older part of this record is a completely different time period. We're moving back tens and tens of millions of years within uh, the Turkana Basin and within Africa as a continent. Most of what you'll hear for the rest of the, rest of the week is going to be much on the much younger interval. If we showed this slide to anybody who's been watching National Ge Geographic specials for their whole life, as I have, where do they live? The answer is going to be obvious. These are from Africa. But what that person on the street is not going to be able to tell you is that those animals actually did come in, they're mostly Eurasian forms that entered into Africa at some point. That some of the forms within Africa today do have ancient roots within the continent, but we also see, as Natasha had mentioned, that we have this major extinction event. And within this is this period of time, so this is the uh, movement of these forms down from Eurasia into Africa, and we do see also the dispersal of a small number of those taxa that were the Afrotheres out of Africa. But it's, a, it's an uneven mix of these two coming across. And so what we see within this, and this is where it was uh, when I had uh, started again back in 79, was this interval of time that's about 10 million years in duration where we had zero fossil sites for the entire continent of Africa. And we named it the missing year. So think about that with regard to this slide. Let's say that here's today. And we're going to push the record back 10 million years where we have nothing back to 10 million years ago with the fossil record there and try to reconstruct what happened in the last 10 million years. That's what we're looking at with this Oligocene-Miocene uh, record. So as, uh, again, as Natasha had mentioned, that that bottom line that I showed you for those Afrotheres and what that record is came out of the Fayum. Here we look at the uh, movie for uh, plate tectonics for Afro Arabia. We hit the reverse button. We close up the triple junction. Gulf of Aden disappears. Red Sea disappears. The East African Rift disappears. And 
the continent here of Upper Arabia is separated off. So here's where we have uh, the Fayum up at the top. So the taxa known from the Fayum have been known since the early 1900s. We've had them for about a million, or sorry, about 100 years, about a century or so. But when we look at the ages of that, uh, one of the nice things about Topper Nawe that you just heard is that there's a volcanic ash dated, or uh, volcanics dated at the top and the bottom. So we have minimum, maximum ages for that. When uh, I first started uh, working in the Fayum in 79, we had some ages for the very top of the section. So this is the Widnell Faras basalt that you see eroding down in black. Widnell Faras means ears of the mare uh, in Arabic. It's a very distinctive site. Ellen Simons was the run, uh, one uh, who ran this project for, for decades. We have some dates on that upper uh, basalt, some that uh, uh, Simons and Freds had run, some that John had run, some that with Carl Swisher I had run. But again, they give us the minimum date. So how old are these fossils actually? We figured they were probably going to be early Oligocene, probably late Miocene. And so what we did was go in and run paleomag on the section. So this is looking at reversals of the Earth's magnetic field. And what we found was a long period of predominantly reversed magnetism toward the base of the section. That is, if you were out in Egypt at that point with your north seeking compass, it would actually point to Antarctica. So uh, with the convention here, if the uh, magnetic polarity is like today, it's shown in black. And if it's reversed, it's shown uh, in white. We had two options for that correlation. One was that long reversal coming in with Cron C13R. The second is C12R, so a little bit younger mostly based on the sedimentation rate, what that curve is showing here, that we uh, thought that correlation one was a little more uh, likely. Eric Seifert, who you mentioned, with some new sites uh, coming in, again, early uh, Oligocene from Oman, looked at those data. And what, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. And what he found, uh, and again, with these sites being intercalated with marine sediments that have an absolute date with them, he actually thinks that the correlation is probably better with uh, Cron 12. So that makes the Fayum a little bit uh, younger. Still testable uh, that we've gone through, myself, Tom Bown, every other geologist who's worked out there, through that Fayum section top to bottom looking for ashes, tephra. We haven't found anything. But uh, who knows, maybe someday something will come in so that we have a date within the middle of that. So here's what we had when I started out in 79. That's when I first met John Flegel also. Uh, Elwin Simon said, OK, Cap, I want you to go down to Komashim and pick up Flegel. And what that meant was driving across the Sahara Desert, across the escarpment, down to Komashim. I had a Dr. Livingston, I presume, moment with John Flegel. And we've been uh, colleagues and friends ever since. So with the Seifert work, uh, what that did was move things a little bit younger. So we have a somewhat fewer missing years within this, but it's still a long interval of time where we don't have any sites. And so try to figure that out when that exchange actually occurred. So what I want to do next is just run you through some of the other sites that have come up from the uh, late Oligocene. Uh, with Topper Nawe, I don't have that in here, but uh, it's going to be uh, down at around Fayum age. And you can see with the red here for the late Oligocene sites, we've actually plugged in quite a few. And I'm going to run through these uh, pretty fast for you. So uh, the first one's with uh, Losadoc that you've heard. This is in, the, uh, 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 in West Turkana, uh, that uh, uh, we have a very thin layer of uh, sediments within that. Uh, there are agalite beds. Uh, they've been uh, dated the basalts top and bottom to about 27, 28 or so. Meve Leakey worked that section in 1987. And the fossils, they collected quite a few fossils there. They only published on uh, a hominoid from there. And they place it at about 25 million years or so uh, in age. Chilga is a site in northwestern Ethiopia that we discovered in uh, 1997, uh, 98. John was along on that project, as was uh, Eric Seifert. And what that did with the dating, uh, those sediments date between 27 to 28 million years old, is that you can see that it moved a lot of the last appearance datums up and down. So we have gomphotheres showing up much earlier in time. We have paleomastodons coming up younger in time. So we move these things around. And we start to fill in those missing years. The embrithopod, the arsenotherium that we have from Chilga, actually got a call out in Pixar's movie Up. So that was, uh, that was kind of a fun thing to have. 
uh, Lukoni, uh, this is again in uh, West Turkana. It's a small sediment hill out there that the French have worked. It is not absolutely dated, but based on the faunal correlations, what's more derived, what's a little bit more primitive, I think it's around 27 or so, probably a little bit uh, younger than, uh, than uh, Chilka. And you can see that it's also filling in records for some of the taxa that we have that we know go through, as you see here. Uh, and some other ones that are interesting with parapathesids that are diagnostic and very characteristic of the Fayum showing up for the first time. Coming down into Tanzania with Rukwa, uh, with uh, Nancy Stevens' work that we have uh, a fossil uh, ape hominoid here named after John, and then we have a uh, M3 from an early monkey. That site comes in at around a little over 25 million years or so. So again, we're starting to plug in what we see uh, from this, uh, this range of time. Now that takes us into uh, the work at uh, Losadak and uh, Nkwai. You can see the sites along the side of the lake here. And when you look at the satellite imagery, all the grayish in here, these are basalts. So uh, we're working into within sediments that are intercalated or underneath these uh, basalt flows that you see. This is the site uh, of, uh, uh, that Benson Kiango had found. So this is in, was found in 1987 when Meath Leakey and Benson went through this area. They collected a lot of fossils, both at Losadoc and uh, at uh, Nkwai. Uh, Meath published on the fossils from Losadoc in uh, 1996. And we were working on the material from uh, Chilga, and we even invited Tab to come down to Nairobi to look at what, we, what she had found in Losadoc. Again, most of it not published. And uh, during that uh, visit, she said, Tab, take a look at these other fossils from the Kwai. He did, and it was one of these holy by golly moments where this was not Miocene, this was Oligocene stuff. And uh, uh, again, just as a, a, a comment for Tab, that he knew these faunas like nobody's business. He, uh, we all cut our teeth on the Fayum at one level or another, but he really cut his teeth there. So uh, that was the beginning of our work uh, in this particular area. Within Losadoc, uh, these are the upper units of the Ragalit beds. Uh, we have about 20 localities in there now or so that we put in with uh, Tyrone Rooney and Alex Steiner who are at uh, Michigan State, a long section here looking at these basalts from top to bottom. Uh, we presented the uh, chemistry on this section at the AGU meetings last December. What we didn't show are some of our dates here. So here is the original dating work from Bruschetto with the base of the irregular beds around 27 or so, a basalt above at 24, so that's where that you know, 25 million number comes in, somewhere in there. Our lowest date that we've run comes out at 28.55, so it's basically within uh, the overlap of this 27.9 date. Uh, we did not get any basalts through here that actually dated out. So uh, last summer, we resampled that section, and I also put paleomag in through these irregular beds, resampled what we think are some tephra up here through the top of that. So we just have to stay tuned on what those dates may uh, end up being. We move south about 100 kilometers to Nakwe, and uh, here we start to see things that those of your fossil collectors start to get excited about. We see channel sands coming in. We see overbank deposits. Some of these are much smaller cha uh, channels. Down here in these large channels, we actually see beds of the Nile oyster theria. So we know that these are large, permanent rivers coming through uh, these areas. This particular hill, we saw this from a distance, and it's just like, you know they're going to be fossils. There in the top of this hill uh, was covered with fossils. Here you can see, maybe, a person in the background up here uh, back some distance. Here's another one of the sites, top 73. And one of the things that's characteristic about this area are all of the capping basalt flows and what basalt flows do when they erode is produce a lot of scree. So this area uh, is covered and covered uh, with scree. When we're looking for the sediments, there are these little pockets, these little windows that we see that we then uh, uh, hit on for the fossils. And the, the bed right above the collector here is a sandstone, so a channel sand. For the dates on that, uh, this is again where we see the, the uh, basalts capping these areas with both an angular and uh, erosional unconformity there. So we've dated those capping basalts. Again, that's going to give us a minimum age for these areas. 
and they come out to between 17 to 16 million years ago or so. But again, that's the minimum age. It's not the age for the fossils and the sediments that are uh, down below. This is a, a, a view from uh, Google Earth that shows basically a north view coming through. The red line here is the base of those 16 to 17 million year old basalts. Remember, that's an erosional base. And for Turi and Kay and for Craig who are out there, it looks very familiar. This is what we do is we put in measured sections coming across through this. Again, remember that everything that's dark here is basalt. So it's not working on nice sedimentary exposures. This is a, a pretty heavy lifting with regard to doing the actual section measuring and a description of the sediments. So here are some of the sections. You can think about this as just putting up fence posts with my farm boy analogy. And within that, then we string along uh, marker beds when we can find those, add the paleo mag to that. And when we're lucky, uh, we can add in some absolute dates. So this is an ash bed that we've dated that comes in at 22.85. We walk that across with these two paleo mag sections that we can correlate with the tracer beds coming through down through here. That 22.85 puts us into plus or minus cron CN, sorry, CN.1R. Uh, and what that shows with this overall section is that Nikwai dates from a little over 21 million years ago back to over 24 million years ago. There is no section that I know in Afro-Arabia that includes this amount of sediment and this amount of geologic time. The other thing we've done, we did this last summer, uh, is to go through and actually fill in some of the intervals where the paleomagic sampling is a little low. So we try to tie in uh, where uh, those reversals actually occur. And in this section, we've added in additional sampling up here and down below the base. Uh, Kevin Uno came through this section after we were there, and he said, Cap, I've seen all of the holes that you drilled. So uh, we've got more samples to run with that. Just to show you uh, briefly some of the fauna that we have that uh, uh, like uh, you saw from uh, Fayum and also from Topper Nawe that it's dominated by hyracoids. This is not any uh, kind of a surprise to anyone. Uh, we also have lots of proboscidea that uh, Bill Sanders at Michigan uh, has been working on this and also at Chilga, so he's very excited about all of this uh, material. Uh, we have lots of creodonts, so they evolved in parallel uh, with uh, true carnivores. So these were the primary carnivore type animals uh, at uh, Nakwai and also at Losadok. Uh, Ellen Miller has uh, uh, recently described the phyomyids, so again, this is a link that we see coming through. Uh, we have, and I'll show you our primates, uh, we have several of these. So this is what we uh, uh, refer to as Camoyopithecus. Jay Kelly and James Rossi are working on some of this material. Jay's not so sure it's all Camoyopithecus. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Uh, but uh, these are uh, specimens that we have uh, from Nakwai that you see here. Uh, here is a uh, upper, upper, sorry, a, a lower right M3 at the top from Nequai, uh, the same tooth from Losadoc. Uh, these are really similar to one another, so we think there's probably time equivalence between these two areas with regard to the morphology of these teeth. Back in the old days, we would have called this Propulsal Africanus, but uh, today we're not so sure what that is, but uh, it just means, again, there's a different kind of a, another ape that's in here, so quite a bit of diversity. Uh, size differences, these are some of the early specimens collected by Meeve Leakey from Losadoc. We think these are probably male females with regard to sexual dimorphism for the hominoids themselves. What's also exciting here is that we start to pick up more of the Fayumian type primates. So we have pliopathesids that you see here, and this is compared with uh, a tooth from uh, the Fayum and one that we have from uh, Nakwai. And here's another pliopathesis, and what it shows is some similarity with some of the later forms from the early Miocene Limnopithecus here. This tooth is a little broken, but maybe this is what we're seeing for some evolutionary diversification from these groups from uh, Nikwai coming into younger intervals of time. We have this monkey uh, that was a, a bit of a surprise. Uh, it's a non-bilophodont, old world monkey. Uh, one of our reviewers of this paper said, that's not a monkey, that's a pig. And so we call it Porcupithecus among the group, but uh, uh, we're able to document that it is in fact a monkey. And so that Bilophodonti probably evolved later on, we're able to document the various steps of the morphology of the uh, dentition of these early uh, 
monkeys. The one here on the left is from uh, Nancy Stevens down in uh, Rukla. So what's it do for the missing years here that we have trying to uh, fill this in? Well, this is where the Losadoc and uh, Nikwai material come in. We've got more time depth that I showed you, but just to make this slide legible, I put everything in here about 22, 23 million or so. Remember that when Meve Leakey collected the Losadoc material, all she published on was the uh, Camoyopithecus specimen. And so what we found within that is our Cynotherium, so that's shown there. And uh, there's uh, uh, also a Dinotherium in there that we've added in. So we have that material coming in as well. Other surprises, we have true carnivores uh, at uh, Losadoc and at Nikwai, so those come in. And here's your, your uh, view test here. So where's the fossil? Well, it's always in the middle. And what this is is a, a suet. So we have a, a true pig coming into the record. So this is our true porky specimen rather than our porky pithecus uh, specimen. So adding these in to what we have for the record, it brings our carnivores down, so from uh, Nikwai and Losadoc, and then it adds pigs in. This is also uh, the only section in Africa that includes these Eurasian immigrants coming in with these Fiumian forms at the same time. So when we look back at that record about that long interval of time where we had no fossils, when did that exchange occur? If you had talked to most people in five, 10 years ago, they say, oh, probably at the Oligomycine boundary, you know, probably at around 23 million. It's looking now like it may be somewhat younger and rather than being instantaneous from all these forms came in, coming in, it looks like they may come in at different times. We may be seeing different things coming in. But again, we have a sample here of n equals two, right, for the number of groups coming in. But when you look at this slide, it's actually starting to fill this in. So this shows the work of the last 30 years or so where we still have a limited number of sites, but we're getting there. And uh, coming down to the south for one of our other sections, uh, this is unpublished, but we have a debris flow here with big pumice class in it that we date to a little less than 21 million. These are all sites coming up through that. Again, this basalt coming in at around 17 for the base. So there's a good chance of being able to fill this record in uh, with even more detail. And for the isotopers who are out there, I had to throw this slide in. This is by Lauren Michael, Tim Timothy Myers, Neil Tabor. Uh, we're looking at uh, C3 diets here that there's a wider range and a, 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 you know, a more positive range of the oxygen here. I was surprised at just how negative uh, Tapernawe is for the oxygen. When we look at this with regard to the taxa, we haven't run that much. These are preliminary data. Uh, the C, uh, the, you know, for the C3, it's, there's range of variation there, but it's all uh, C3 diets. When we look over at the oxygen, you know, for the gonfotheres, maybe there's a change through time, but you know, for four samples, I'm not gonna bet my lunch today on that. Uh, but uh, uh, the oxygen data and the carbon data may give us some other options about what's actually driving that. We still don't know what drove the extinction. We lost a lot of animals. Was it competition with those Eurasian forms coming in or did the afrotheres go extinct before? These are major questions we don't have the answers to because we don't have still enough data to address them. So finally, I just want to say uh, thanks to all of you for listening to this, and also uh, a note of thanks to our colleagues who have passed on uh, from us, uh, and that includes Richard Leakey as well, and that letter of his that I still have, and also thanks to our uh, funding agencies. Thank you very much.